Today we're going to be revealing the first piece of Revelation. Now this might be controversial since many people have theories about the first piece of Revelation, and especially who's going to be the Antichrist. And since there are so many prophecies and parallels in the Bible that point to this piece, we need to address most of them. This will be the most ambitious video I've done. Buckle up, this is going to be a long ride. I'm going to hit you with everything I got to convince you what is the first beast. The identity will come early enough in the video, but if you are patient and stay until the end, I will do summary slides and try to connect all the various pieces together. And if you're not convinced what is the first beast by the end of this video, there's no convincing you. Let's read about the first beast in Revelation 13. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for forty-two months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. The next part of Revelation goes into the second beast, who we know as the Antichrist. But today, we're going to just focus on the first beast. Now, the first thing we have to mention here is on the first slide. It's the most obvious thing people know about, and we'll highlight the important parts. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. For people who study the Bible, most know these animals are the same animals in Daniel 7. Let's read it. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Daniel mentions four beasts, first a lion, second a bear, third a leopard, and the fourth beast a terrible one with ten horns. If we slide this over here on the left to make room for the comparison to Revelation 13 and that first beast, if we put the description of the first beast in the order it appears, we see the first thing are the ten horns, then a leopard, a bear, and finally the lion. If we color code the animals, we see they are the same animals, but they are listed in reverse order. And bringing this into sharper focus, Daniel 7 separates these four beasts as four different beasts, while Revelation 13 says it will be one beast, like the animals of Daniel 7. That's important context. The first beast of Revelation, although it's one beast, will have the characteristics of the four beasts in Daniel 7. And if you look further into Daniel 7, it says what the four beasts are. Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. So here in verse 17, it describes the four beasts as four kings. But then, a little bit later... Then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms. It's clear from this chapter that the fourth beast will be a kingdom, as are the other three beasts too, as what is a king without the kingdom he rules? Four separate kings with four separate kingdoms. And we know that this fourth beast from Daniel 7 is the first beast of Revelation, because both of them have those same ten horns. The description of the first beast being a kingdom fits into the video we did about what are the two beasts of Revelation, because we know the first beast rose up out of the sea, which is also referenced in Daniel 7.
Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The four winds stirring up the great sea is a reference to the great flood of Noah, when the world was covered with water. That would be an unmistakable reference to the great sea in Noah's time. Because if you read your early Genesis, the first kingdom in the Bible came after the flood of Noah, and it was the kingdom of Nimrod. We did a video about him, and this is a spoiler if you haven't watched this video. Nimrod is actually Cush, the son of Ham. He would be that lion, the first beast or kingdom in Daniel 7. And if you know your Genesis, Cush was described as a mighty hunter. So that description of Cush being a mighty hunter fits perfectly into the first beast being a lion in Daniel 7. So we know after the flood of Noah started the kingdoms on earth. And the fourth beast of Daniel will be a kingdom. And that description of Daniel's fourth kingdom matches the description of the first beast of Revelation because they both have those ten horns. So the first beast of Revelation is definitely a kingdom or a nation, not a person. And if we want to go deeper and study those ten horns, they are referenced by other sections in Revelation. In chapter 12, there is a mention of the dragon, which we know as Satan according to the book of Revelation. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. The dragon or Satan also has those ten horns, the same as the first beast in chapter 13. But if you really want to know what those ten horns are on the first beast, you just have to go to chapter 17. The book of Revelation tells you exactly what the horns are. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. The horns are ten kings. To summarize, the first beast is a kingdom or a nation, and the ten horns are ten kings. That authority of one hour will lead us to identify the second beast or the Antichrist, but we aren't ready to do that right now. We're just focusing on the first beast with those ten horns, or more precisely, the ten kings. Recently, we did a video about how the Daniel 12 prophecy has been fulfilled. If you haven't watched it, you should, because we're going to go a little bit further from that fulfillment today. The Daniel 12 timeline prophecy talked about 1290 days and 1335 days. We showed how those dates pointed to two very specific people, and they are John F. Kennedy and Joe Biden. Those two people were presidents of the United States. They were the fulfillment of the prophecy because they were the first two Catholic presidents of the United States. Even today, they're still the only two Catholic presidents. We'll come back in a bit and connect that further. Some people have questioned this fulfillment and why would either Catholics or presidents of the United States be the fulfillment of biblical prophecy? Now we're going to unravel something that will be huge. If you put John F. Kennedy here, and then Joe Biden there, and start to place all the presidents in between the book and fulfillments of the prophecy, let's read them off. John F. Kennedy, then Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and then back to Barack Obama and Joe Biden. Remember, we end here because the fulfillment of Daniel 12 was the year 2008 and the election of Obama, which included Joe Biden. The first prophecy fulfillment of 1290 days pinpointed John F. Kennedy's death in 1963. And 45 years later, the second fulfillment of 1335 days pointed to Joe Biden being elected into the White House in 2008. Now, if we start with Kennedy and number those presidents all the way to Obama Biden, we get 10 presidents, which is the same number as the first beast in Revelation, the one with 10 horns. Remember, Revelation 17 said those 10 horns would be 10 kings that did not have a kingdom as of the writing of Revelation. 10 presidents or 10 kings, these 10 presidents are the 10 horns of the first beast of Revelation. Bam! 
And since the first beast of Revelation is a nation and the ten horns are presidents of the United States, that means the first beast of Revelation is the United States of America. Let that sink in. This is definite. The biblical prophecy has been fulfilled. The United States of America will be the first beast of Revelation. I know there are lots of people that will have a problem with this. I've seen so many Revelation videos and preachers that think they know who the Antichrist is. They're going to be wrong and could fall victim to the deception of the Antichrist. The Apostle Paul talks about this, that there's going to be a great delusion where God's people are going to believe the Antichrist lies. That's why later in Revelation, the Antichrist is called a false prophet. Some people might think he'll be a good guy sent by God, but he'll be deceiving people. And I don't want you to blindly follow me either. Test what I'm saying and see if it squares with the truth of the Bible. Not your preconceptions. I know this will be hard for people to accept, so I'm going to thoroughly go through the Bible and connect as many things as I can. I challenge everyone who is skeptical of this to watch the rest of this video. I'm going to hit you with the kitchen sink. It might even seem overkill at some point, but I think it's critical for you to accept that the United States fulfills everything as the first beast of Revelation. We're going to spend a lot of time in Daniel, as this book parallels end time events in every chapter. Let's look at Daniel 2. The king of Babylon is troubled by a dream, and only Daniel, through an inspiration from God, can tell the king what was in the dream and its interpretation. Here's the interpretation of the dream. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. This is a rather well-known biblical story. The image in the king's dream had elements of gold, silver, bronze, iron, and iron mixed with clay. Now Daniel goes on to give us a head start in figuring out what the elements of the statue represent. This is the dream. You, O king, are king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. You are this head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. There's more pertinent information in this passage, which we'll get to later, but we know from this chapter that Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, Babylon, is the head of gold, and the rest of the elements of the statute are different kingdoms that will follow his. So let's go back to the statute and place Babylon as the head of gold, and if you look at the rest of the book of Daniel, it will identify some of the other kingdoms. In chapter 5, we know Nebuchadnezzar's son Belshazzar orders the vessels of God to be brought from the temple. He drinks from them, which infuriates God. So God takes the kingdom away from Belshazzar in Babylon. And in verse 28, it clearly says what the next kingdom will be. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. So if the head of gold was Babylon, we know from chapter 5 that the next element, silver, belongs to the Medes and Persians. Then in chapter 8, there's a vision given to Daniel in which he sees a ram and a goat battle. And within the interpretation of the vision, it says this, The ram which you saw, having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia, and the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. So we can now confirm that after the Medes and Persians came the kingdom of Greece, which helps us to identify the bronze element on the statue. And this tracks well with world history and its major kingdoms at the time. Now we just have to figure out the iron legs and then the feet of iron mixed with clay. The rest of the book of Daniel doesn't explicitly say what the next kingdoms are, as represented by the iron legs or the feet of iron mixed with clay. But it doesn't take a lot of homework to figure out what dominant kingdom came after Greece in history. The kingdom of Greece that the book of Daniel is talking about is the kingdom of Alexander the Great. Then after his death, it left a power vacuum, and that time was called the Seleucid Era. 
There were lots of different rulers and kings trying to gain control, and for some time, no one kingdom was able to establish control over the whole region, until you get to Rome, as Rome became the superpower of the world after the Kingdom of Greece. It's generally accepted with Christian scholars that Rome is the iron legs from the statue in Daniel 2. And there's some beautiful dual meaning here that Rome, which killed Jesus Christ, didn't break his legs on the cross. The only breaking of legs in the kingdoms are going to come from the rock of Jesus. That lesson will come later, and it's a doozy. But as we go farther, we will come back to this statue and its elements to show somewhere else in Daniel that prophesizes Rome will be the next kingdom on this statue. So if it's generally established that Rome is the legs of iron, and I've already said that the United States is the first beast of revelation, then the United States would have to be on the statue too. And the only other section of the statue left are the feet and toes. Let's read the rest of Daniel 2 about the feet and the toes. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it. Just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, and as the toes of feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. So the feet and toes were partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. This video about the potter and the clay would be very useful to watch and understand the deeper lesson of the clay, as the potter is of course God, and baptized Christians are the clay. God made mankind out of the earth. Dirt plus water makes clay. Here in Daniel 2, it goes further and describes the iron mixed with clay as they will mingle with the seed of men. Do you remember what the trigger was to fulfill the Daniel 12 prophecy? Oh, that's right. It was triggered by the first two Catholics to be elected into the White House, John F. Kennedy and Joe Biden. Now let's bring the statue from Daniel 2 back. The last element was iron mixed with clay. Catholics are the clay that is mixed with the iron of the beast. Make sense? And we can connect this another way too. We showed you between the fulfillment of presidents between Kennedy and Biden, there were 10 presidents. Those 10 presidents were defined as 10 kings in Revelation 17. And these 10 presidents fulfilled the 10 horns of the first beast of Revelation. We went over that. But now, draw your attention to the statue of Daniel 2. Now look at that last element of feet. This is so good. Since their feet, that also means there be 10 toes on this statue, which matches the 10 presidents, the 10 kings, and the 10 horns of the first beast. Booyah! Which means the last element on this statue is the United States of America which again confirms the USA is, or rather will be, the first beast of Revelation. But why are Rome and the United States as represented on this statue connected with the same element of iron? That common element belonging to both the legs and the feet will be explained fully later. We'll connect Rome and the United States first this way. Let's read this from Revelation 17. But the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life, from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was and is not, and yet is. Let's keep that last part highlighted. The beast that was and is not, and yet is. That was. After its republic fell, Rome had its first emperor in 27 BC. Rome was the global superpower in the time of Jesus, and it was the empire whose power killed Jesus Christ. He might have been betrayed by the Jewish elders of his time, but he was undoubtedly killed by Rome. And is not. The fall of Rome happened in 476 AD when they are conquered by a Germanic king. And yet is, if I can prove that the USA is somehow a rekindled version of Rome, then that would explain this last part and why the last element on the Daniel 2 statute would have that common element between Rome and the United States. And if you watch the rest of this video, we'll concentrate on the time frame of those 10 horns on the first beast.
So this is how the beast that was and is not and yet is gets fulfilled. And since we know that the first beast turns against God's people and will overcome them, then that would fulfill the ultimate parallel that Rome was the instrument to kill Jesus, and then the United States will be the last instrument to kill the followers of Jesus. We just have to show how the United States has similar characteristics to Rome, and it does. Actually, it's quite remarkable. First, we'll talk about the history of Rome. Rome was founded around 750 BC, then later became a republic. At the heart of this republic was the Roman Senate, which advised on matters of the city and population. Then there was a legislative body that sprang up called assemblies. These assemblies passed laws governing Rome while it was still a republic. Rome lasted quite a while as a functioning republic until internal divisions occurred around the first century BC. Rome didn't officially have an emperor until Augustus in 27 BC. The historians don't count Julius Caesar as an emperor because he didn't have the same title as Augustus. He named himself dictator for life, but he didn't last long as a mob assassinated him only after about a year in power. So nearly all scholars count Augustus in 27 BC as the first emperor of Rome. We'll slide this over so we can show the emperors from Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Galba, Otho, Vitellius, and then Vespasian. We end with Vespasian because he was the emperor when the Jewish temple was destroyed. And all of these emperors will be discussed and connected to something big later in the video. But now let's get rid of the emperors and compare the structure of Rome to the United States. The United States was founded in 1776 and also structured as a republic. In fact, after the government was formed, there's a famous quote by Benjamin Franklin. When asked what kind of government we had, he said a republic if you can keep it. In the United States structure of government, they also have a Senate and an assembly called the House of Representatives. The government was structured with checks and balances so that the executive branch and the presidency would not become any kind of dictatorship. They fought for their independence from a British king, and the Founding Fathers didn't want the country to fall back and be ruled by a king. And if you followed the politics of Washington in the last 100 years, that's exactly where the country is going. Too much power to the federal government and away from the republic it was supposed to be. And I'm not criticizing any one party. The government has grown under Democratic and Republican presidents. It doesn't matter the party. This beast is growing unabated. So both Rome and the United States were first functioning republics. They both had a Senate and assemblies of people to enact laws. We do know that Rome, after much internal divisions, became a dictatorship under the rule of an emperor. The only thing to wait for in the parallel is the United States, which is having its own internal divisions right now, is to become a dictatorship too, under the leader who we know will be the Antichrist. And all this will fulfill the ultimate parallel. Rome killed Jesus, and Revelation says the Antichrist turns against and kills Christians. Once you understand the parallels, then you can piece things together. The United States is the fulfillment of the Roman Empire. So there are lots of connections between the structure of Rome and the United States. But I'm going to divert from comparing the United States and Rome for now. This might seem like a tangent, but I will connect the Bible to it a different way to show you this connects multiple ways. When talking about the first beast of Revelation, there's another section in Revelation which overlays the same events. And it's in chapter 6, what is commonly known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. We don't have to read them all, but you have four horsemen with four different horse colors. White, fiery red, black, and pale. They describe a very dark time in Revelation especially when you get to the fourth horse and this description. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death. And these means of killing represent what the four horsemen will do to kill mankind. But the next part starts to connect things. And by the beast of the earth. Now some people take this literally when roving bands of predator animals like lions will be killing mankind. I don't think that's accurate. Let's wipe away the first three horsemen. I think the killing under the fourth horseman by the beasts of the earth are referring to the first two beasts of Revelation 13. The book of Revelation constantly refers to other sections in the book with common words, so you can connect them back together. And when we follow this through, 
this connection of the beast in the fourth horseman to the beast of Revelation 13, which I am saying is the United States, will become crystal clear. But I have to continue to make my case. In the description of the four horsemen, I'll slide in more information. There are small, unnoticed parts by most people, and those are the four living creatures, which call out to each horseman. The first living creature said it was one of the four living creatures that called out to the first horseman. Then the second living creature calls out to the second horseman. The third living creature calls out to the third horseman, and this squares up with the fourth living creature calling out to the fourth horseman. You can see how the number of the living creatures correspond to the number of each horseman. So even though the first one says it was one of the four living creatures, it stands to reason that it was the first living creature calling out to the first horseman, since the rest of them are in numerical order. And we can find these living creatures identified here in Revelation 4. Before the throne was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. We just mentioned that the order of the living creatures corresponds to the number of the horsemen as they are listed. The first white horse is paired with the lion. The second red horse is paired with the calf. The third black horse is paired with man. And the fourth pale horse is paired with an eagle. Now there's lots of significance to these four living creatures and their order. These four living creatures represent animals or a people that have had control over God's people. We'll slide the living creatures up here. We mentioned earlier about the four beasts in Daniel 7, how the first beast was like a lion represented the kingdom of Nimrod, who was actually Cush. The symbolism was that Cush was described as a mighty hunter, which connects back to the lion of Daniel 7. And if you watch the videos on Nimrod and the Table of Nations, then the story about the Tower of Babel goes much deeper than the surface level. Cush had oppressive control over God's people when they became the Hebrew people. And then the killing of God's people started to happen, which is why God came down to stop the building of Babel and scatter the people across the earth. So this is why the first living creature in Revelation was a lion. We can go now to the second living creature, which is a calf. And after the Tower of Babel, the Hebrews go to Egypt, where they become enslaved. We know that cows were sacred in ancient Egypt. But the animal that stands out here is an ox, because while enslaved, the Hebrews work like oxen in the Egyptian fields. So when God frees the people, culminating with the death of the firstborn in Egypt, the Hebrews go to Mount Sinai, where they become impatient with Moses coming down from God's holy mountain. The people greatly sin by having Aaron make a golden calf as a god to go before them. And the deeper lesson here is that the Hebrew people work like oxen, only to be freed by God in the killing of the firstborn in Egypt. And this horrible sin that the Hebrew people would commit to make a god molded as a golden calf connects back to an ox whose young offspring would be called a calf. And if you want a great finishing touch, if you know your exodus, Aaron, the brother of Moses, made the golden calf, and he explained when he made the calf that it just came out of the fire. Now, if you go back to Revelation 6 and the second horseman, who is connected to the second living creature, which is a calf, the color of that horse is fiery or flaming red, which connects back to Aaron saying the calf came out of the fire. So all of this is why the second living creature was a calf. It came out of the fire as a god to go before the Hebrew people. Now, the third living creature is man. After Mount Sinai, God's people head towards the Promised Land. There are lots of problems with the Israelites staying true to Yahweh. The period after they first enter the Promised Land is called the period of the Judges, which is what the book of Judges is named after. The last verse in Judges explains the problems well. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Yep, that would be a problem, even in today's world. God is supposed to decide right and wrong for all of us. Then the judges themselves had problems. Their sons were corrupted. 
so the people demanded something. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. The people demanded a king to rule over them. Then God spoke to Samuel. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. God says the people are rejecting him. The people demanded a king or man to reign over his people. And that is why the third living creature is man, because man, and not God, now ruled over God's people. Well, the kings didn't fare too well. Again and again, Israel drifted away from God, described as being unfaithful to him. If you read both the books of Kings, you'll see how it really goes downhill. So eventually, God is tired of his people's unfaithfulness and leads them into captivity and exile, under the man we mentioned earlier, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And that brings us back this time to Daniel 4. Nebuchadnezzar, just like in chapter 2, is troubled by another dream. So Daniel warns him, but this time with a way out. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, and its interpretation concern your enemies. Belteshazzar is Daniel. His name is changed earlier by the king. Now Daniel goes on, And inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. God will let Nebuchadnezzar remain as king if he knows that heaven rules and acts righteously. But Nebuchadnezzar just couldn't help himself. The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. Because of his pride and arrogance, God is taking away the kingdom from Nebuchadnezzar. And then this happens. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Nebuchadnezzar becomes like a beast, and his hair is like that of an eagle, with nails like bird's claws. So the third stage of ruling over God's people starts with man and then while in captivity transforms a man into something with the characteristics of an eagle. Which brings us to the fourth living creature, which is an eagle. Now there are lots of scriptural connections to an eagle. Deuteronomy is a great book as the Hebrew people were going into the promised land and Moses was giving them instructions and warnings. One of the warnings was this. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything, therefore you shall serve your enemies, whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and in need of everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies." This verse fits perfectly into the context of the fourth and last living creature being an eagle. God was warning his people way back in Deuteronomy that an eagle will become a symbol of the people's disobedience. And that fourth living creature, the eagle, was paired with the fourth horseman of the apocalypse, which we read in totality. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The fourth living creature, which is an eagle, calls out to the fourth horseman on the pale horse who brings death to the world. Now just wait a moment. I'm going to stop here and reset because I'm just getting revved up to connect everything and blow your mind. Let's just restate this. Only in God's amazing, 
interconnected story would the fourth living creature be an eagle which is connected to the fourth horseman who brings death to the world using the beast of the earth those beasts of the earth turn out to be the two beasts of revelation 13 which includes the first beast who we know will make war with the saints and overcome them then only in god's perfectly coordinated story would that first beast turn out to be the united states of america whose national symbol is the bald eagle. Wow, just wow. And all this connects back to the fourth living creature being an eagle because it has power over God's people. This is perfect symmetry. It's not a coincidence. This can only be coming from God. I'm telling you, you know it's right when everything connects perfectly. And speaking about things not being a coincidence, we've been connecting Rome and the United States as having similar structures of their governments with the parallels between them. Let's add the bald eagle to the list on the United States. And guess what is the symbol or standard of Rome's military might? You can't even make this up. The Roman eagle. Oh my, these things are connecting everywhere, but only because God and his glorious paralleled story had them connect in every way. Much like the United States, the Roman eagle was a symbol of freedom and courage. It was used as the standard of a Roman legion, which would lead their troops into battle. Remember how I said that every living creature had control over God's people? Well, Rome, with their symbol of an eagle, did have control over God's people in the time of Jesus. And before that, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, at the end of the reign of the kings of man, finished with him being transformed with an eagle's characteristics. With that known, read Ezekiel 17, the same time period as Daniel. And say, Thus says the Lord God, a great eagle with large wings and long pinions, full of feathers of various colors, came to Lebanon and took from the cedar the highest branch. He cropped off its topmost young twig and carried it to a land of trade. He set it in a city of merchants, then he took some of the seed of the land and planted it in a fertile field. He placed it by abundant waters and set it like a willow tree. Then within this chapter in Ezekiel, God explains the eagle. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Say now to the rebellious house, Do you not know what these things mean? Tell them, Indeed, the king of Babylon went to Jerusalem and took its king and princes and led them with him to Babylon. So just like Nebuchadnezzar starts to turn into an eagle in Daniel 4, God gives his prophet Ezekiel a symbolic story which includes the king of Babylon being symbolized as an eagle. But this doesn't end there. Earlier in the chapter, it included this. But there was another great eagle with large wings and many feathers. And behold, this vine bent its roots toward him and stretched his branches toward him from the garden terrace where it had been planted, that he might water it. It was planted in good soil by many waters to bring forth branches, bear fruit, and become a majestic vine. There was a second eagle. And that second eagle in Ezekiel 17 represents Rome as Rome and their eagle symbol will have control over God's people, the Jewish people in the time of Jesus. And going back when the two kingdoms of Israel started to drift away from God during the reign of the kings, one of the prophets to the northern kingdom, Hosea, said this, Set the trumpet to your mouth, he shall come like an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. Israel had rebelled against God, but look at that language. Set the trumpet to your mouth, he shall come like an eagle against the house of the Lord. We've already shown how there were two eagles in Ezekiel's vision and that Rome was symbolized as the second eagle. In order to connect the eagle of Rome more, we have to talk about Herod the Great. Yes, this is the Herod that tried to kill Jesus when he was born in Bethlehem. But before that incident, with Jesus as a young child, Herod gained power through his father's connections in Rome, and was made governor, first in Galilee, then eventually as ruler over Judea. Now Herod was a half-Jew who did many things, and one of the things he did was to rebuild and modify the second temple. And as he rebuilt the temple, in order to remain in Rome's favor, Herod placed an eagle over the temple's entrance. That eagle above the temple was viewed as blasphemous by the Jewish people. There was a rebellion, and the eagle was cut down with axes, and the conspirators were killed by Herod. But there was an eagle over the temple of God. 
which explains the verse in Hosea. He shall come like an eagle against the house of the Lord. God does fulfill everything said through his prophets as the Roman eagle was over the house of the Lord. Now we're going to go to another prophecy fulfilled in Daniel 9. I promise this will also connect the dots too and show you how God was indeed prophesying about Rome in the book of Daniel. This one is going to be amazing. Let's read it first. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be the one who makes desolate. Even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. First, this prophecy is known as the 70 weeks prophecy. Lots of Christians know about this prophecy as it points to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, confirming a new covenant with humanity. Praise the Lord that through the sacrifice of Jesus, we again get a chance to live with God in paradise. But the confirmation of this covenant happening in the last week is not what we'll be focusing on here today. What we'll be addressing is the first part of the prophecy, or the first 69 weeks. It's written like this. That from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now we know that when the Jewish people were in exile in Babylon, there was a command to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. And there's another beautiful dual meaning here. At the end of Revelation, heaven comes down and is called the New Jerusalem. So at the end of time, Jesus again will be restoring Jerusalem. But back to this prophecy. This third line is speaking about our Messiah, Jesus Christ. But in the fourth line, the 69 weeks are separated out as seven weeks and 62 weeks. That's an interesting way to phrase the time frame and definitely tells me we are talking about two different periods of time that mark something significant. And if we go to verse 26, let's highlight something. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. So after the 62 weeks, the Messiah is cut off. Now, most people think this is also referring to Jesus since he is the Messiah. But this verse in 26 is only referring to Messiah, which is different than verse 25 referring to Messiah the Prince. Now, both verses use the same Hebrew word, but verse 26 is missing the Prince. That might be significant or it might not. So let's get rid of verse 25 for now and look at the Hebrew word Mashiach that is translated as Messiah. Now, even if you don't know Hebrew, you can look up alternate uses of this word. This word that is translated as Messiah can also mean anointed one. Now, the Messiah would be considered anointed, but there also could be others. Kings, priests, and prophets can also be anointed by God. So if we place both verses 25 and 26 here, as a Christian, we all know that Messiah the Prince is referring to Jesus Christ. A prince is the son of a king. So it fits that Jesus Christ, the son of God, would be referred to as a prince. And obviously the Messiah, as he was anointed to be our king, our Lord and Savior. But before we understand verse 26 and that Messiah or anointed one, we have to understand the context of this prophecy. Let's read the most important part here. That from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Now people who study the Bible know about this command and the person who issued it during the Jewish exile. You can find this person written about in four books of the Bible. His name is Cyrus and you can find this specific command in the book of Ezra.
Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. In his first year, God stirs up the spirit of Cyrus, who has overthrown the kingdom of Babylon, and now has control over God's people. Then Cyrus issues the command to rebuild God's house, or what we know as the second temple. In fact, over 150 years before this, God inspired Isaiah to prophesy this. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. So God being God would know the future and how he would use a Persian king, Cyrus, to rebuild the temple and Jerusalem. So if you combine this in Isaiah with Ezra 1, this is the command that Daniel 25 is talking about. Cyrus issued the command cited in Daniel 25, but this is about to connect a few more things. If you keep reading Isaiah, the next chapter 45 is still talking about Cyrus. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him, and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. Did you catch that? The Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus. This word anointed is the same word used in Daniel 9, verse 26, that was translated as Messiah. So you see, that same word can be translated as anointed. And we just read the book of Ezra saying that God stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. This means that Cyrus was anointed by God to issue this command. Remember, I said prophets would be considered anointed as well. Now let's go back to verse 26 in Daniel 9. What if this word that is commonly translated as Messiah is actually supposed to be referring to an anointed man by God? Remember verse 25 and the starting point of this prophecy is about the command to restore and build Jerusalem. So let's try it out and retranslate verse 26 this way. And after the 62 weeks, the anointed one shall be cut off, but not for himself. What if verse 26, knowing the context of verse 25 about the command to rebuild Jerusalem, is referring to Cyrus here, who was anointed by God and issued the command to rebuild Jerusalem? This might be hard for some of you to accept, but let this play out a bit. I'm plainly stating that verse 26 here is about Cyrus and not Jesus. If you've studied the Bible yourself or have seen any of my videos, you know that God leaves clues in the scriptures in order to figure things out. The book of Daniel has a really important detail at the beginning of most chapters. In the chapter about the 70 weeks prophecy in Daniel 9, this detail is in the first verse. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Remember the statue from Daniel 2? We know for a fact that the kingdom to come after Babylon was the Medes and the Persian kingdom. So when Darius the Mede took control over Babylon, that would be the same time when Cyrus the Persian took over as king too. And if we come back and see Ezra 1, we see he issued the command in his first year, the same year as Daniel 9. The 70 weeks prophecy, which begins with a command to restore Jerusalem, happens at the same time as Ezra 1, when Cyrus issued the command to restore the temple, or at least happened in the same year. But there's more. Now that we've established Darius's first year and Cyrus's first year were at the same time, we can get rid of the Daniel 2 statue. Most of the other chapters in Daniel also include when the stories and prophecies happen. And if we're zeroing in on the time frame between the end of the kingdom of Babylon to the beginning of the media Persian kingdom, then we just need to look at Daniel chapter 5 because that chapter addresses the fall of the Babylonian kingdom and when the Medes take over. The son of Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, is now king of Babylon. He takes the sacred vessels from the temple of God and drinks from them. For this profane act, God takes away the kingdom from Babylon. 
and here comes a big detail to connect things further. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Do you see the connection? Let me spell it out for you. The Daniel 9, 70 weeks prophecy, which happens in the first year of Darius, speaks of three different time frames. The last week with Jesus, but also the first two parts of seven weeks and 62 weeks. Do you think it's a coincidence that when Darius takes over Babylon in his first year, that he's 62 years old? I don't think that's a coincidence. Not at all. God leaves these clues behind so you can connect them together. So if we broaden this out to include all three chapters, we know this all happened at the same time, or more precisely, the same year. And if you buy this connection as coming from God, then what do you think he is saying about all three of these things happening at the same time? I'll show you what I think it means and how to unlock the 70 weeks prophecy in Daniel 9. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, we know this command was issued by Cyrus and Ezra 1 in the first year of his kingdom. Okay, we'll move on. Until Messiah the Prince. I and most scholars agree that Messiah the Prince here in verse 25 is referring to Jesus Christ and the start of his ministry. Now to the big part. There shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, the anointed one shall be cut off, but not for himself. We'll get back to the last four lines in a bit. I've already put forward that verse 26 here is referring to the anointed one, Cyrus, who was anointed by God and issued the command to restore Jerusalem. Verse 26 connects the anointed one being cut off with the 62 weeks. So if everything is connecting to the number 62, including Darius being 62 years old at the time of this prophecy, then let's highlight the fourth line in verse 25. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now most people take this at face value, but what if the connections to the number 62 happening in the same year means that the 62 weeks are supposed to come first? If you can accept that or even follow along with me, then come back to the trigger point of the prophecy that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. This command also happened in the same year as Darius being 62 years old and the prophecy itself. Then if the 62 weeks comes first, then you just have to know when this command was issued in history. Now it's hard to pinpoint exact dates in the early Bible, but as we get closer to the time of Jesus and the calendar changing, historical records become more exact. We know when the Babylonian kingdom ended and the Persian kingdom took control. That happened in the year 539 BC. But before we start breaking down the prophecy, we have to understand how to fulfill the prophecy. I did say we weren't going to get into the last week of the prophecy, but we do need to look at verse 27 because that verse gives us the way to figure out the prophecy. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Now we know verse 27 is referring to Jesus Christ. His sacrificial death brought an end to sacrifice and offering. Every Christian believes this. But the last week of the prophecy states that he brought that end to sacrifice in the middle of the week. Here are the basics. We know that last week has seven days, so the middle of the week would be three and a half days. That three and a half time period will be key to connecting the last week to end times, but that will come later. If all Christians believe that this is referring to Jesus Christ, then we just have to show a connection to his ministry. In the Gospel of John, there are marking points in his telling the story of Jesus, and they are the three Passovers. I would say the majority of scholars think that Jesus' ministry lasted three years, but his ministry didn't officially start until he was baptized by John the Baptist. Most scholars think that Jesus was baptized in the fall around September to October. So let's plot this out. And for this, it doesn't matter if you think his ministry started in the year 27 AD or 30 AD. 
I think it started in the year 30 AD, but I'll do both. If John baptized Jesus in the fall of the year 27 or 30 AD, then this is when his ministry began. Then the first Passover would be the next year, then the second Passover would be the next, and finally the third Passover would either be in the year 30 or 33 AD. If you are counting the actual years from the marking point of John's baptism of Jesus until his death, you would be closer to two and a half years. But that's not how Bible prophecy works. If you count the years that are involved, either 27 through 30, or my preferred dates of 30 through 33, you would have four different years involved, fulfilled by those Passovers. But because they aren't full years, this would be symbolized by three and a half years. Which brings us back to Daniel 9. This prophecy states that he will bring an end to sacrifice in the prophetic time of three and a half days, which is fulfilled by the three and a half years of Jesus' ministry. The number is the same, but the days are fulfilled as years. So with this known, let's start applying this to the seven weeks and 62 weeks of the 70 weeks prophecy. I've already said that the Bible is indicating the 62 weeks comes first. So we'll start there. We know that a week has seven days in it. So we just have to take 62 and multiply it times seven and you get 434 days. But remember, years are being exchanged for days in the last week. So we'll do it here too. The 434 becomes years in order to figure out this part of the prophecy. Then we know from the prophecy up here that the starting point was the command to restore Jerusalem. We've stated that the command from Cyrus happened in the year 539 BC. So if we take the date 539, subtract those 434 years since we are in BC, and you get 105 BC. Now that date meant nothing to me at first, but I had to keep digging. I found that there are historians that place this date 105 BC as the year when the Roman Republic fell. Oh, that gets us back on track to connect Rome. But not every historian agrees on that date. But 105 BC being a significant date will become more clear. Now remember, Rome is having those internal problems in the Republic. So in 105 BC, they gave the title of consul to a Roman general by the name of Marius. Now the title of consul was the highest position anyone could attain in Rome at the time. In fact, this Marius was named consul seven times. He was that popular of a leader for the country to lean on as the Republic had problems. This time in 105 BC was the second time Marius became consul. Okay, if this was such an important position and Marius was consul seven times, why would the second time in 105 BC be so important to God for it to fulfill one part of the Daniel 9 prophecy? Now you just have to look at what Marius did when he became consul that second time. He made lots of reforms, and as a general, his focus would of course be on the military. And one of the reforms he made while consul this second time was to eliminate all the multiple standards of the army, to coalesce under one symbol. And guess what that symbol was? The military would now only be led by the symbol of the eagle. Bingo! I told you we'd come back and connect things together. Does this sound thin to you? The Roman eagle being a fulfillment to the Daniel 9 prophecy? Now you have to realize what the book of Daniel is all about. His visions were mostly about kingdoms and animals representing those kingdoms. This date in history was the trigger to begin the fourth living creature, the eagle. It's reign over the earth and God's people. Remember, I said that Ezekiel 17 included two eagles and that Rome was that second eagle? And if the Roman eagle became the standard of the military, then every time the military would go into battle, the eagle would lead the army. So if we focus on Jerusalem and the Jewish people about that time, after the death of Alexander the Great, which led to the Seleucid era and Antiochus IV desecrating the temple, there was a Maccabean revolt and the taking back of the temple. That is celebrated by the Jewish holiday known as Hanukkah. So the Jewish people had regained control over their temple and the city. This period was called the Hasmonean Dynasty. But as the Republic of Rome fell into centralized control, its empire began to grow. 
and it would just be a matter of time until Rome expanded its control over Jerusalem. And we know that Rome did in fact take control over Jerusalem in 63 BC by the Roman general Pompey. And if a Roman general would conquer a city, guess what would lead them into battle? Yep, the Roman eagle. Once again, the eagle, the next and last living creature, would conquer and control God's people. This is starting to make sense in the context of the fourth living creature starting its reign. The eagle became the Roman military standard after the 62 weeks were fulfilled, which fits into the context of the book of Daniel. Animals representing kingdoms and those kingdoms control over God's people. But there's another part to this prophecy. What about the seven weeks? Let's go to a new slide and use the same calculations as the 62 weeks. We start with the seven weeks. There are seven days to a week. We multiply the seven days times the seven weeks and get 49 days. Again, this prophecy converts days into years, so the 49 days becomes 49 years. Now at this point, we have to work backward. What I mean by that is that this prophecy segment ends at this point until Messiah the Prince. We've already established nearly all Christian scholars agree this refers to Jesus Christ. So this segment of the prophecy must land on a point in the life of Jesus. We just have to find a significant period of 49 years that ends with Jesus. I told you there's controversy though. Some people think his ministry started in 27 AD, while others think it started in 30 AD. I think it's 30 AD and I'm about to give you support for that view. If we say that Jesus was baptized by John in the fall of 30 AD, then working backwards, subtract those 49 years from that date, it gets you to the year 19 BC. And 19 BC is a very significant date. That was the year that we spoke about earlier when King Herod refurbished the temple and placed an eagle over the temple of God. Oh my, this has come full circle and connected everything again. So let's go over this prophecy timeline. The first segment of the prophecy is the 62 weeks, which starts at the command by Cyrus to restore Jerusalem in 539 BC. The 62 weeks ends in 434 years at 105 BC, when General Marius is elected consul of Rome and makes the eagle the official standard of the Roman army. This is the beginning of the fourth living creature, the eagle, and its reign over God's people, which is an important context to grasp because when the Roman general Pompey conquers Jerusalem in 63 BC, the Roman army would be led by the eagle. The seven weeks begins in 19 BC when King Herod starts to refurbish the temple and places an eagle over the house of God. Then the seven weeks are fulfilled as 49 years, and those 49 years ends with the beginning of Jesus Christ's ministry in 30 AD. Also, we went over how Jesus' ministry lasted three and a half years and ends with his death. But another key point was that he was put to death by Roman soldiers who would have been led by the Roman eagle. And the death of Jesus would not be the end of the eagle over God and his people. After Nero's persecution of Christians in the 6th decade AD, there was a Jewish revolt. And this revolt was put down by Roman general Titus, who would destroy the temple of God in 70 AD. And once again, any Roman army would be led by the eagle, which fulfills the eagle destroying the temple of God. So Rome and its eagle was the fulfillment of the Daniel 9, 70 weeks prophecy. And if we come back to the prophecy itself, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Yep, the people to come did in fact destroy the city and the sanctuary, the Roman army with their eagle symbol. And the series of events in history fits into Revelation 2, as the Jewish people were the first witness of God, and their temple in the end is destroyed, which is talked about in Revelation 11, with the two witnesses being overcome. Now let's open this up more. There is an Old Testament book about the judgment of God, which leads to salvation. This book also prophesied the birth of Jesus. And that is the book of Micah. 
Well, chapter one ends this way. Make yourself bald and cut off your hair because of your precious children. Enlarge your baldness like an eagle, for they shall go from you into captivity. Baldness like an eagle, for they shall go from you into captivity. If the United States is the first beast of Revelation and its symbol is the bald eagle, then this verse has a lot of foreshadowed meaning. Now we bring back Revelation 13 about the first beast. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And then we pick up something about the first beast in chapter 11 within the two witnesses. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. So we know from Revelation itself that the first beast will overcome and destroy God's saints and kill them which was foreshadowed by the book of Micah talking about baldness like an eagle and going into captivity. Now we'll come back to the Rome and U.S. comparison. We've already shown these last three on the Rome side and how the Roman eagle became the symbol of Rome, which led to their emperor and the killing of Jesus. We'll just add a new wrinkle to it. In Revelation 11, there are two witnesses. The first witness is the Jewish people, and you could even say back when they were the Hebrews and the Israelites too. The witnesses' function was to witness about who was really God. In this first case, it was Yahweh. And we know that Rome gained control over God's people, which led to the killing of Jesus, who was a Jew witnessing about Yahweh. This led to the Roman army destroying the Jewish temple in 70 AD, the temple of the first witness. Now let's compare this to the parallel of the United States. We know the United States symbol is the bald eagle, and when it becomes the first beast of Revelation, it will be led by the Antichrist, and we know from Revelation will turn against and kill Christians. We can add that the second witness of God are Christians who are also witnessing about God, but this time that Jesus Christ is God. And when the first beast kills Christians, it will also destroy a temple of God. It will destroy the spiritual body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit. The deeper we go with these parallels between Rome and the United States, we see how everything is matching up perfectly, piece by piece. And if we bring in an end times verse from Jesus himself, this passage in Matthew 24 about looking for the coming of Jesus makes more sense. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. There will be deceptions in end times, so don't be deceived, because the eagles will be gathered together at the carcass. Yep, the eagles, as in the bald eagles of the United States, which will be the vehicle for the Antichrist to start killing God's people. And according to Revelation, he will succeed. Before I get to the rest of the video, I need to ask you a personal favor. If I've convinced you that the United States is the first beast, then I'm asking you to share this video as often as you can on whatever social media you use with your recommendation. This is not for my benefit. My channel is not monetized. Although I can monetize, I've decided against it. I truly believe these connections are coming from God, and I'm not going to be making money off my channel anytime soon. This is me trying to help people understand what's about to happen. Paul talked about a great delusion that will be coming to the world, and people are going to believe the lie. I'm very aware of what other people say about Revelation, about who's going to be the Antichrist. Those people are going to be deceived. I need to warn as many people as possible. Everything is going to be backwards. The Antichrist will try and act like a good guy sent by God. He's going to get many to believe that someone else is the Antichrist, and he's doing God's work by killing him. This will be the deception. Remember, Paul also said that Satan acts like an angel of light. So if I can get this video out there about identifying the first beast, then more people will be ready to realize who the Antichrist is as he takes power. So please, if I've convinced you, share this video as much as you can along with your recommendation. Thank you and God bless. Now back to this video. The Bible can be a complicated book, but if you study it hard enough, 
God leaves a way for you to figure out things. We mentioned this chapter earlier, but Revelation 17 is a great chapter for you to figure out the symbolisms used in the book. We're going to break it down verse by verse. Verse 7 starts out right away saying it's going to reveal the mystery of the woman, which we know from the beginning of chapter 17 to represent the great city of Babylon. There's dual meaning here about the beast that carries her, as both the dragon, who is Satan, is described in chapter 12 having seven heads and ten horns, but also the first beast in chapter 13 has those seven heads and ten horns. Remember, the dragon gives the first beast its power, so it fits they both would have the same seven heads and ten horns. This will be talked about more as we move along. Now in verse 8, we talked about how the beast that was is a reference to Rome and its emperor having control over God's people in the time of Jesus, and is not is referring to the empire of Rome which fell in 476 AD. And this part, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit, is not only a reference to Rome being fulfilled as an empire through the United States, but also the four angels that are released from the darkness in chapter 9 that we talked about in our last video, The Locusts. Those four angels are also behind the events, leading to the first beast getting its power and bringing death to the world. This is when the United States becomes the global superpower, subduing all the other nations on earth. Then this last part about going to perdition just means that this will end badly for the Antichrist kingdom, leading to its destruction. And we know, as faithful followers of Christ, that Jesus wins in the end. The next sentence talks about those who dwell on the earth will marvel is a quote from Revelation 13 about the first beast. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. The world largely is going to willingly follow the first beast to their own destruction. Then this part about names not being written in the book of life is pretty straightforward. God knows who's going to make it and who's not. Then this verse ends with another reference to the beast that was and is not and yet is, as Rome was the final beast, then was not as it fell, and then becomes the yet is fulfilled through the United States when it grows those ten horns. We'll talk about the time of the ten horns in greater detail soon. Let's go to the next verse 9, which sets up something large. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman, Babylon, sits. Now I know many people think they know that these seven mountains are referring to Rome and its seven hills, but they're going to be mistaken. We went over this in our three-part series, The Tower of Pentecost, The Two Pillars, and The Two Witnesses. Those videos followed all the examples in the Bible to reveal that the great city of Babylon is earth itself. Every story in the Bible about Babylon also has the dual meaning of Satan's kingdom, and since he is the ruler of the earth, his kingdom would be earth, and that matches up with the great city of Babylon. So if we fade back the rest and emphasize just the seven mountains on which the woman sits, since the woman, the great city of Babylon, is earth, those seven mountains are the seven continents of the earth, and that is how this fits together. We'll also get deeper with this one in a later verse. Here's the next verse 10. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. We know that Jesus lived and died during the empire of Rome. In order to figure this out, we just need to bring back the Roman emperors from earlier. Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Galba, Otho, Vitellius, Vespasian. We end with Vespasian because he was the emperor that ruled when the Jewish temple was destroyed in 70 AD. This will parallel the Antichrist dominating and overcoming Christians and the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now you can see that there are nine emperors here, but just wait, this will be good. We talked about that Jewish revolt in 66 AD, but there was more internal conflict in Rome after the death of Nero in 68 AD. It led to civil wars and a power struggle between army factions. The emperors of Galba, Otho, and Vitellius all declared themselves emperor, but there wasn't widespread support, and 69 AD became the year of the four emperors, ending with Vespasian. And if you like your parallels delicious and know the book of Daniel, then this will be tasty.
In Daniel 7, that chapter that talks about the four beasts, there is a little horn that comes out of the ten horns, which most people know as the Antichrist. That little horn plucked out three other horns before him. And if that little horn is the Antichrist, we know he will be the one to overcome Christians and the spiritual temple of God. And I don't think it's any kind of coincidence that Vespasian, who destroys the temple in 70 AD, also plucks out three smaller horns before him. Oh, and God continues to use parallels inside and outside of the Bible. So let's come back to connecting these Roman emperors to this verse. There are also seven kings, five have fallen. These five emperors had already died by the time John wrote Revelation, and they were the emperors before the temple is destroyed. Then the three smaller horns are removed, just like Daniel 7 says the little horn will do to its three horns. And we come back to the top, one is, which is Emperor Vespasian, who authorizes the destruction of the temple of God. And then we read the last of the verse, and the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must continue a short time. This person is going to be the second beast, the Antichrist, or that little horn in the future. And that is how this all fits together. Then we'll wipe verse 10 away, but keep the emperors so we can bring in verse 11. The beast that was and is not is a reference to the empire of Rome that is fulfilled as the United States. This reemerged kingdom, duly represented by the eagle, is himself also the eighth and is of the seventh. The first beast of Revelation, the United States, just like its predecessor Rome and its emperors, will persecute God's people and destroy the temple of God. We talked about verse 12 with the ten horns being ten kings, as they are the ten presidents of the United States from 1963 to 2008. We won't get into the one hour yet. That will come in time when we reveal who the Antichrist is. Now verse 13, these are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. During this span of presidents from Kennedy through Obama-Biden, the United States has become the global dominating superpower of the world, and all the presidents have given their power and authority to the United States to make it this superpower. The only thing to wait for is the Antichrist to take over and make it the first beast of revelation. Let's go to verse 14. These will make war with the Lamb. We talked about how the two witnesses in Revelation 11 and the first beast in Revelation 13 describe that the Antichrist and his kingdom, the United States, will turn on Christians and overcome them. But fear not, my brothers and sisters. We all know that the Lamb, Jesus Christ, will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Amen. I pray for all of us to be faithful to our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Now on to verse 15. I'm excited for this part. This is so good and will connect so many different things. The waters which you saw where the harlot sits. This harlot is a direct reference to the great city of Babylon, which we've stated is earth. Then since the harlot is earth, then the waters where she sits would be all the oceans of the world, since earth is made up of 70% water. So the harlot would sit on many waters. These waters come back and refer to the great flood of Noah. You'll find lots of New Testament references to Noah's time for a reason. That was also the marking point in Daniel 7 when the four beasts came out of the great sea. That sea was the great flood of Noah. God wanted to wipe out sin once and for all and start again with Noah and his family. We all know that sin came off that ark. But that's not all that came off that ark. If you read through early Genesis, and this is the key, the first kingdom happened after Noah's flood. That kingdom is described in the Tower of Babel story. We did a series of videos about that time, including this video about Nimrod. We told you earlier about this and how Nimrod is actually Cush, the evil son of Ham. Cush's kingdom was the Lion Kingdom of Daniel 7 and had oppressive control over people and even started to kill God's people, which is why God came down to stop the city from being built. After the flood came the Tower of Babel. God stopped the city, then scattered the people to different lands and confused their languages so they would not be able to become one again. This was the point that God created the peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues that came out of the waters. 
Let's go deeper and connect more things. In a previous video, we talked about the theory of Pangaea. This theory states that the world once was one supercontinent, and that at some point the continents drifted away from each other, creating those seven continents. If you look at the continents on a map, they really do appear to be able to fit together like pieces of a puzzle. Within this theory, we explored when this could have happened in the Bible's time frame, and the most likely time frame would have happened during the cataclysmic flood of Noah. It certainly fits that the flood would be the marking point for the first kingdom in Babel, and also would be what caused the seven continents to come into existence. Remember, the harlot sits on seven heads. Those seven heads are the seven continents of the earth. So if we take away the maps, this circles back and connects to the harlot Babylon being Earth. The flood becomes the marking point to create those seven heads of the harlot Babylon in order for God to create those peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. You see how all this fits together perfectly? This reinforces the theory that the great city of Babylon is Earth. And if you want to really put this over the top, Let's reformat the bottom here and restate this. Noah's flood was the starting point of kingdoms. The first one was Cush's rebellious kingdom, detailed by the Tower of Babel. And only after Cush started to kill God's people did God come down to scatter the people to different lands in order to create those peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Here we go. Only in God's amazing story would it come back full circle in the last rebellious kingdom, the first beast of revelation, which I've identified as the United States of America, and that country would be known as the Great Melting Pot, where all the peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues come to live. Oh my, there are so many layers to this. Now we go to verses 16 and 17. And the ten horns which you saw in the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, and to give their kingdom to the beast, until the words of God are fulfilled. We've been plainly stating that the great harlot Babylon is earth itself. So we'll explain about the ten kings and how they will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. We've identified the ten horns as ten kings. Those are the ten presidents from John F. Kennedy to Obama Biden. We got those presidents from the Daniel 12 prophecy between the dates of 1963 to 2008. Now, the first prophecy date pointed to John F. Kennedy. He was elected in 1960 and took office in 1961. But the prophecy doesn't point to him as president. The date points to 1963 and his assassination. That's a huge point. And if we regather all the information together, these ten presidents are the ten horns of the first beast, which is the United States. So if the ten horns are those ten presidents, then something must have happened to the United States during the span between those presidents to help and make it a beast. We know after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, the United States did become the only superpower of the world, which is the time frame of those ten presidents. We also know that the prophecy points to Kennedy's death. So we need to look around that time frame to understand something larger. And if you look into the era around that time, you will find a big warning from someone. That warning came from the president before Kennedy. And the president before Kennedy was Dwight Eisenhower. We don't have to look at Eisenhower's presidency, just his farewell speech. He gave a rather famous speech with an ominous warning. Here it is. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Eisenhower gets credit for the phrase, military-industrial complex. The military-industrial complex is a description of the relationship between the nation's military and the industry which supplies it. The theory goes that the contractors in the armament industry need to continually have those new contracts, so they buy influence of generals and politicians in order to influence them to create new wars for the need of the new weapons. It's a never-ending assembly line of wars in order to supply the defense industry with its contracts. Now, you might not buy into this theory or not, but we're going to keep going. 
This influence peddling of politicians has led to coin another phrase, and that is the Iron Triangle. The Iron Triangle is a description of the relationship between Congress, the bureaucracy, and the interest groups wanting things. In the case of the military-industrial complex, the armament industry influences the politicians to support the bureaucracy needed to send contracts back to the industry. It's mutually beneficial to all three points of the triangle. And let's bring up the obvious thing here. It's called the Iron Triangle. Remember the statue in Daniel 2? The United States was the feet made with elements of iron and clay. Oh, and by the way, Rome also had legs of iron. When it fell as a republic and into emperorship, that coincided with the end of the Iron Age. So God's use of the common iron elements in the statue has a lot of meaning. But let's get back to the iron of the United States. Eisenhower's farewell address was a warning about the military-industrial complex. There's no denying that. Now we have to start talking about Eisenhower's successor, Kennedy. We know that the Daniel 12 prophecy pointed to his death and not his election, and nearly everyone knows the questions raised about his assassination. I would say it's split whether Americans believe the government of the United States was somehow behind killing Kennedy. But I would venture to say almost everyone thinks we don't know the whole story. And his assassin, Oswald, definitely did not act alone. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of his death. I'm just going to go on to something that has come up recently. Kennedy was viewed by many to bring an heir of Camelot to the White House, especially with his young children. I wouldn't say he was some kind of dove or peacenik. He went through the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis between Russia and America that almost brought war to the world. So Kennedy was generally supportive of the Cold War against Russia, which included the confrontation of communism in Vietnam. The Vietnam War, although we had presence in the country, didn't really escalate and start until 1965 after his death. Kennedy had increased military advisors in the country, but the U.S. presence was still at a small amount during his presidency. And with this kind of proxy war playing out, it never goes smoothly. The U.S.-supported regime in South Vietnam had problems, which led to the coup of the government and the murder of the leader, Diem. That happened on November 1st, 1963, which must have shook Kennedy. Kennedy had been advised about failure in Vietnam the year before, so he wanted a troop drawdown in the country. The military advisors didn't want that, but then things escalated, and Kennedy's political advisors went public with his intention of a total withdrawal of all Americans in Vietnam. That briefing took place on November 20th, 1963, two days before his assassination. So with all the questions surrounding his assassination and most people not believing Oswald acted alone, then we can really start questioning if the government of the United States was behind Kennedy's death. Remember the Daniel 12 prophecy video? The prophecy fulfillment didn't start with Kennedy's presidency, but his death in 1963. I think that's significant. The Bible itself seems to be pointing the finger at the government. This whole video is about the first beast of Revelation, which I've hoped to have you convinced by now is the USA. I personally think this is clear, especially since Kennedy was killed by a mortal head wound that the government of the United States, the first beast of Revelation, was behind his assassination. Let's add one more thing to help convince you too. We'll wipe away everything on the top and bring in a verse at the end of Revelation. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. This section comes after both beasts are defeated by Jesus. But please note, this states that people will be beheaded for their witness to Jesus. Those beheadings come from the first beast of Revelation. I think this is the signature of the first beast and Kennedy's assassination was the first mortal head wound by this newly formed beast, the United States of America. Last video about the locus of revelation. I must have seemed like an arch conservative that doesn't like liberal policies, but now with this video, I might seem like a liberal from the 60s. I'm actually in the middle politically, just following the connections in the Bible, no matter where it leads me. During most of my life as an American, I supported most of the wars my country fought. 
Only in the last 10 years did I come to realize the United States was creating more problems with its military adventurism than it was solving. I think disengagement in other countries having autonomy is what would have been best for the world, but that ship has definitely sailed. In reviewing the events of the world and connecting them to the Bible, the beast needed to be a beast again. Rome started this with its persecutions of Jesus, Christians, and the temple, and the United States will finish this by again persecuting Christians and destroying the spiritual temple of God. The only thing left to fulfill in this parallel is for the United States to have those same internal divisions as Rome and become an empire with an emperor, who we know will be the Antichrist. And if you're following the news, you know the United States is having those severe internal divisions. And if the first beast is the United States and the second beast is the Antichrist, then it stands to reason that the second beast will be a president of the United States, the most protected man in the world, and a whole agency, the Secret Service, whose mission is to protect the president of the United States. He's driven around in the most protected vehicle in the world, an armor-plated limousine. Can you guess what the Secret Service code name is for the limo? Its nickname is The Beast. Oh, unbelievable. Only in God's amazing story could this be hiding in plain sight and connect perfectly in so many ways. Now, I said we weren't going to talk about the Antichrist. Well, directly anyway. But I do have to bring up something that will knock your socks off. Here are the relevant parts in the story of the Antichrist. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he deceives, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. The person known as the Antichrist is this second beast, but he's not going to get you to worship him. He's going to get you to worship the first beast, which is his kingdom. And according to this, the penalty for not worshiping his kingdom is death. This episode about worshiping an image of a kingdom was also foreshadowed, of course, in the book of Daniel. It happens in chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony, with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Now the rest of the story goes on to mention the three friends of Daniel who do not worship the statue and are cast into the fire, only to be saved by the Son of God. Sound familiar? I did a video on this comparing Daniel 3 to Revelation 13. The parallels match up perfectly. But I said in the video that if you study Daniel 3 hard enough that it would lead you to identify the first beast of Revelation. Well, I've already identified the first beast as the United States. So let's look at that statue in Daniel 3. Let's analyze the dimensions. It was 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. Now, there are different theories as to what a cubit is, either 18, 21, or even 25 inches. But in this case, you don't have to worry about the conversion of a cubit. You just have to look at the dimensions of the statue. The dimensions of the height to the width are at a 10 to 1 ratio. We know that the United States is fitting all the prophecies and parallels of the first beast, including worshiping the image in Revelation 13. Wouldn't it also fit perfectly that this statue in Daniel 3 would be paralleled in real life? Now, you just have to look at the United States and find some kind of image or statue that would also have that 10 to 1 ratio. And you don't have to look too hard into it 
once you look at the capital, Washington, D.C., the heart of the government, because the Washington Monument also has that 10 to 1 ratio. Whoa, this is getting deep, but just wait, this is going to blow your mind. The Washington Monument was designed by Robert Mills in the 1800s. It was completed in the year 1884 and dedicated in 1885. In 2013, they measured the height and it came out to be 554 feet, 7 and 11 32nd inches, with the width 55 feet at the base. But they also measured the height in 1884 and it came out to be 555 feet, 5 and 1 8 inches. Now having this very tall obelisk design would be vulnerable to something that occurs naturally, and those are lightning strikes. So they commissioned an aluminum capstone to be cast and placed on top of the monument to act as some sort of lightning rod. Now, it really didn't work out that well as a device, and over the years, spikes have been added to the top to help divert the lightning strikes. Even after the monument was finished, lightning struck the monument right away. They estimated the capstone had been melted by the heat of the lightning about three-eighths of an inch. So if this capstone was melted about three-eighths of an inch, and they measured the monument as 555 feet and five and one-eighth inches, then if you add the supposed melting of the capstone into the height, it brings the monument pretty darn close to being 555 and a half foot tall. And here comes the boom. Since this is measured in feet, we know that there are 12 inches in a foot. If you take the 555.5 and multiply it by 12 inches, you get nothing but sixes. And that, my friend, is the mark of the beast number. The United States is, or rather will be, the first beast of revelation. How am I doing so far? Do I have you convinced? Is this overkill yet? I'm going to keep going to show you how it fits every angle. Now, personally, when I came to Christ, one of the things I struggled with was that God would know whose names were written in the book of life. He would know my future and the choices I would make before I even made them. I've since come to realize and accept the all-knowing power of God. So if he knew our futures, then as the Bible was being lived and written about, he would know how it would play out too. And if he knew how it would play out, then these parallels would be clues about how this will end. So I started going through the Bible looking for clues as to the identity of the first beast being the United States. Then I started to see all these references to the number 50, as in foreshadowing the 50 states of the USA. We'll start with Genesis 10 and 11. Right before the Tower of Babel story in chapter 11, there's a whole chapter about the nations that came out of Babel after God scattered the people. This is commonly referred to as the Table of Nations in Genesis 10. We did a video on this and how to count the names listed as 70, which matches up with Jewish tradition of the 70 original nations of the earth. But if you analyze the names in Hebrew, there are regular names and there are names written in plural form, as in peoples. And if the names are listed as peoples, they probably came after God scattered the people. There were 20 names that are written out in plural form that came after Babel. That means that out of the names listed in the Table of Nations, there were 50 people that were in Babel before God came and scattered the people. 50 names that were under the oppressive rule of Cush before the breaking up of the city. Let's look for more examples. I did a couple of videos about the two rebellious sons of David, whose stories duly represented Satan trying to gain control over God's kingdom. The names of the sons were Absalom and Adonijah. When Absalom started to have designs to take his father David's kingdom away, in the beginning of his plans was this verse. After this, Absalom provided himself with chariots, horses, and a retinue of fifty. So Absalom, the person trying to take over his father's kingdom, started out with a retinue of 50. How about the other rebellious son, Adonijah? Then Adonijah exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. Again, the other son of David, trying to be king, had 50 men run before him. Both rebellious sons of David, trying to take over, had 50 men at first. Do you see how these parallels use the number 50 at the beginning of their plans to take away the kingdom? Do you think this is a coincidence? 
I'll keep going. How about David himself? We know that Jesus and David are paralleled as Jesus inherits the kingdom of David. Before David's son Solomon builds the temple of God, David had bought the area of the temple for God. Here is that section in the second book of Samuel. The king, however, replied to Aruna, No, I will not buy it from you at the proper price, for I cannot sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 silver shekels. So the threshing floor, which becomes the sacred place for the temple of God, was bought for 50 shekels. Can you see how these stories continually have the number 50 in them with its deeper significance? Now, before we show you the last two examples of 50 in the Bible, Let's come back to the parallels of Rome and the United States. We've established that the United States is the fulfillment of the Roman Empire, the beast that was and yet is. And then the United States becomes the vehicle for the Antichrist to start turning on and killing the people of God. Well, if the USA has 50 states before it becomes a dictatorship under the Antichrist, then if these parallels are as perfect as I say they are, we should find the number 50 in the history of Rome too. Let's take away the top four parallels between both to make room for our last parallel, the number 50. And you don't have to look too hard into the history of Rome when you focus on the first Emperor Augustus. Due to civil wars and internal divisions happening in Rome, there was a great buildup in the number of Roman legions. So Augustus had to disband many of the legions because they all might not be loyal to the new emperor. And guess how many legions there were when Augustus disbanded them? Yep, there were 50 legions disbanded when Rome became an empire with an emperor. And that also matches the 50 states of the USA, which will become an empire with an emperor. But this last time, it will be led by the Antichrist. Don't you think these numeric parallels that are happening in the Bible also happen in real life? The God of the Bible is the same God outside of the Bible, and he is foreshadowing with these numbers and parallels what's going to happen in the future. Most people have heard about the prophet Elijah. Here is his connection to the number 50. King Ahaziah falls from an upper room, but he sends messengers to consult a false god. So since the king didn't consult the one true God, God sends Elijah to meet the messengers with this consequence. Therefore you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. The king doesn't take well to that and sends men after Elijah. Then the king sent a captain with his company of 50 men after Elijah. Elijah responds by calling down fire from heaven on the 50 men and destroying them. So the king sends another set of 50 men. And again, Elijah calls down fire and destroys the second set of 50 men. I love contextualizations and seeing the deeper symbolic story. The king fell through an upper room, kind of like Satan in his fall from heaven. God cursed the king with a death sentence, just like God did to Satan. The first set of 50 men are consumed by fire. I see the first set of 50 men in real life as represented by Rome and its 50 legions that are consumed. And then the second set of 50 men represent the USA and its 50 states that will be consumed by the fire of God. We do know that the first beast will lose in the end to our Savior Jesus Christ. I see the numbers in Elijah's story symbolically telling the overall story between God and the beast come after his people. God is the author of life, and he uses numbers and patterns to connect things. Now, I saved this last example of 50 in the Bible because it's so meaningful. In chapter 11, when the two witnesses die, there's this description. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. I've gone over this, that the great city of Babylon in Revelation is earth itself. So our Lord Jesus would be crucified there. And also Egypt was the place where God's people were enslaved and oppressed. Just like Revelation 11 and 13 describes God's people becoming oppressed too. Now let's look at the last description of Babylon earth being referred to as Sodom. 
I've also said before that this earth is going to end. So if earth is being referred to as Sodom, in addition to me saying the world is going to end, then we need to go back to Genesis and the story of Sodom and Gomorrah for a huge parallel that will connect more things. I would say most people have heard about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and that those cities were destroyed by God because of the rampant sin. Well, this destruction happens in the time of Abraham. God visits Abraham before going on to Sodom. He tells him of the grave sin of the city and that God has come down to see it himself before destroying the city. But Abraham intercedes for any innocent people left in Sodom, and there is a negotiation of sorts between Abraham and God. Abraham asks God to save the city if he finds a certain number of righteous people. It goes on for ten verses until God agrees not to destroy the city if he finds the number of righteous people. Guess what the numbers are? Abraham starts with the number 50. Again, there's that number 50. But wait, this gets better. As Abraham negotiates down, he ends up settling on the number 10. The numbers start with 50 and ends with the number 10. Let's get rid of the verse to bring this into focus. The first number starts with 50, as in the 50 states of the United States of America. And if you remember what we said earlier, the first beast of Revelation starts to grow those 10 horns, which are those 10 presidents from Kennedy to Obama Biden. Wow. But that's not everything. We're going deeper. If you watched our last video about the locusts of Revelation, that video detailed the leader of the locusts to be a bad angel by the name of Abaddon. And in both languages, Greek and Hebrew, his name means destruction. Just like the countdown before Sodom went from 50 down to 10 before its destruction. This stuff is no coincidence. And to put a cherry on this, that bad angel, Abaddon's name was connected to Joe Biden. And also the trigger to end the sequence of the 10 presidents also ended with Joe Biden being elected into the White House. Oh my. When you place this into perspective, you can see how everything connects. But that's not the last of this as we slide off the Locust video. This video is about how the first beast of Revelation is the United States of America and how that will lead to the persecution of God's people and eventually the destruction of the world. In the chapter about the two witnesses, we get to a key inflection point after the second witness is killed by the beast. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. In the great city of Babylon, which is symbolized as Sodom in chapter 11, the second of the two witnesses are resurrected and a tenth of the city is destroyed. Exactly like the countdown in Sodom, which started with 50 and ended with 10, that led to its destruction. So Satan sets up his last oppressive kingdom, the 50 states of the USA, and that beast is awakened by the 10 horns or 10 presidents. These numbers are matched by God, where the 50 states of America leads to a destruction of a tenth in the city of Babylon. God uses the same numbers as Satan, but he uses them to hand out his divine justice. I can go on and on with this numerology or the number patterns. This is very real and purposeful by God. He's been placing the numbers into the Bible and history to help you see what will happen in the future. I know this has been a really long video, and since it's been a long video which touched so many prophecies and parallels, I will do a summary to show you how the parallels and the book of Daniel was fulfilled by the United States as the first beast of Revelation. We start with the statue in Daniel chapter 2. This statue had elements of gold, silver, bronze, iron, and iron mixed with clay. The book of Daniel identified the first three elements plainly. Chapter 2 identifies the head of gold as the kingdom of Babylon. Then chapter 5 says that the Medes and the Persian kingdom came after Babylon, so that fulfills the silver element. Then chapter 8 describes the kingdom of Greece comes after the Media Persian kingdom, so Greece would be the bronze element. We know from world history that after the kingdom of Alexander the Great of Greece, there was a power vacuum that wasn't filled until Rome became the superpower of the world. So that would fulfill the legs of iron. We will leave the statue for now. 
we read Revelation 13 and its description of the first beast that had ten horns with characteristics of a leopard, bear, and a lion. We found those animals in Daniel chapter 7, which had four separate beasts described like a lion, bear, and a leopard, and a fourth beast with ten horns. The animals are exactly the same, just in reverse order with a special note that the first beast of Revelation is described as one beast with the characteristics of the four different beasts in Daniel 7. Daniel 7 clearly identifies the fourth terrible beast as a kingdom, which matches Revelation's first beast saying it came out of the sea, because kingdoms only started after the great sea of Noah. Since Daniel's fourth beast is described as having ten horns, that matches the description of the first beast having ten horns. We know these are talking about the same animal, or more precisely, the same kingdom. Those ten horns are clearly identified in Revelation 17 as ten kings who had not received a kingdom as of the writing of Revelation. Then we talked about the Daniel 12 timeline prophecy, which talked about 1290 and 1335 days. Those days were converted using a biblical formula that pinpointed two very specific dates, 1963 and 2008. Those dates are meaningful because 1963 was the year that John F. Kennedy was assassinated and 2008 was the year that Joe Biden was elected into the White House as vice president. Those men are significant because they are the only two Catholic presidents to the United States. We come back to the statue in Daniel 2 and zero in on that last kingdom. It was described as iron mixed with clay. We went over this in a previous video about the potter and the clay. The potter is, of course, God, who made and shaped mankind like clay. The first man, Adam, came out of the dirt, and baptized Christians would be the water needed to remold mankind back into the image of God. So this explains why the first two Catholics would fulfill the Daniel 12 prophecy. The iron was mixed with clay. Then we show between the prophecy fulfillments of 1963 and 2008, there were 10 presidents, which is the fulfillment of Revelation 17 that described the 10 horns as 10 kings. Those 10 presidents become the 10 horns of the first beast of Revelation, which matches the 10 horns of the last terrible kingdom in Daniel 7. And if we come back full circle to the statue of Daniel 2, we see how the last element of feet would also have ten toes. And since the ten presidents connect to the statue, then it confirms the last kingdom on the statue of Daniel 2 would be the USA. And if we open up the rest of this, we see it all connects perfectly and confirms that the first beast of Revelation 13 is the United States of America. We'll wipe everything else away except for the statue and the elements. We talked about Daniel 9 in what is known as the 70 weeks prophecy. At the beginning of the chapter, it said this happened in the first year of Darius the Mede. And if we glance back at our Daniel 2 statue, we know the second kingdom was an alliance of the Medes and Persian kingdoms. So the first year of Darius the Mede would also be the first year of the Persians. This was all we needed the statue for, so let's wipe it away so we can focus on the 70 weeks prophecy. We showed you about the prophecy in Isaiah that talked about Cyrus being anointed by God to rebuild Jerusalem. That man Cyrus was the king of the Persians, so his first year would also be the first year of Darius the Mede. We then talked about in Ezra 1, in verses 1 through 4, it clearly describes Cyrus issuing the command to rebuild the temple in his first year, which is also the same year as Darius taking over. That is when the 70 weeks prophecy was given to Daniel. The prophecy said that it started when the command was issued to rebuild the temple, which happened by Cyrus in the same year. The 70 weeks prophecy talked about seven weeks, 62 weeks, and then a last week to fulfill the new covenant.
Then we bring in Daniel 5.31 to see the fall of Babylon. There's a key detail in the first year of Darius the Mede. He was 62 years old. And since all these things happen in the same year, we take it as a sign from God that this command and his age connects back to the 62 weeks in the 70 weeks prophecy. That means that the 62 weeks is supposed to come first when the command was issued. So let's switch the two fulfillments so that the 62 weeks comes first. We know from recorded history that Babylon fell in 539 BC. So it stands to reason that from this point would be the starting point to start counting the prophecy fulfillment. We showed you how to figure out the prophecy. 62 weeks is converted to 434 days, which represents 434 years in real time. We take those 434 years and subtract it from 539 BC, and we come up with the date of 105 BC. That date is the unofficial year when the Republic of Rome fell, and Rome elected General Marius as Consul of Rome. Marius made several reforms, one of which is key here. He made the official standard of the military, the Roman Eagle. We explained how the context in the book of Daniel used animals to represent kingdoms in the world, so it fits that this date in history would be significant to God because of how the symbol of the eagle would be used against God's people. Then we continued with the prophecy and converted the seven weeks to 49 days, which also represents 49 years. We found that the distance between King Herod remodeling the temple in 19 BC and placing the eagle above it was 49 years exactly until 30 AD, the beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ, which is also the beginning of the last week in the 70 weeks prophecy. All of this emphasizes the importance of the eagle. God had been using animals as symbolic representations throughout the Bible. So this is how to interpret the Daniel 9, 70 weeks prophecy. It's the beginning of the eagle and its symbolic rule over God's people. Now that we've talked about the eagle, let's go to a summary about the four living creatures, the lion, calf, man, and eagle. Those living creatures are found listed in Revelation 4 and are connected to each of the four horsemen in chapter 6. The lion with the white horse, the calf with the red horse, man with the black horse, and the eagle was paired with the fourth pale green horse. We're going to get to that eagle in a second. These living animals represented nations that had power over or animals that were raised above God's people. Briefly on the first three, that lion represented the kingdom of Cush as what happened at the Tower of Babel. These videos detail the deeper story of what happened at the tower, and God, of course, gives you the connection to the animal and how Cush was described as a mighty hunter, which matches the lion here, and also the lion in Daniel 7. Now, the second living creature is a little easier for everyone to recall. The calf was the animal that the Hebrew people made as a god to go before them. This was a horrible sin by the people, which led to the beginning of the Levitical priesthood. And the third living creature is man. We went over how the first book of Samuel said that the people had rejected God ruling over them when they wanted a king like the other nations. The first king was Saul, which led to David, and then the two books of Kings details the rest of the kings and the events as the Israelites kept drifting away from God. And then God got so angry with his people that he led his people into exile under the rule of the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And only in a bit of divine foreshadowing would God let man rule over his people and then when man let the people drift away from God would he turn a man into the creature with the characteristics of an eagle which then becomes the fourth living creature it's no coincidence that the Daniel 9 70 weeks prophecy pointed to the eagle because that was the beginning of the Roman eagle and its oppression and persecution of God's people Let's just review the dates. The first point of the 70 weeks prophecy landed on 105 BC when Marius was elected consul of Rome and made the eagle the official standard of the Roman military. In 63 BC, Jerusalem was conquered by the Roman general Pompey, whose army would have been led by the eagle. 
In 19 BC, Herod refurbished the temple and placed an eagle over the temple to honor his allegiance with Rome. In 33 AD, Jesus Christ was killed by Roman soldiers. And in 70 AD, the Jewish temple was destroyed by the Roman army under Titus. This was a key moment in Jewish history. And all of these are going to be parallels to what is coming for Christians. You see, the Jewish people are the first witness to God, and they have already faced their persecution under the eagle. But there's a second witness to God. And they are Christians. They're going to endure the same sufferings as the Jewish people under that symbol of the eagle. And then the next important date during the reign of the eagle is 1782, when the bald eagle was made the official emblem of the United States. So let's wipe away all the dates of Rome, the beast that was, so we can bring in the beast that yet is, as the United States becomes the fulfillment of Rome and is the first beast of Revelation. Now comes my favorite part. I included the four horsemen on top for a reason. And the eagle of Revelation 4 is paired with the fourth horseman, the one on the pale green horse. That rider brings death to the world. His rider is even named death. And if we bring in the description of the means of death here, we'll highlight just the last part about death by the beast of the earth. You know this is right because it's so convincingly perfect. Those beasts of the earth are the two beasts of Revelation 13, which includes the first beast, the United States of America. The official emblem of the United States becomes the bald eagle in 1782, and only in God's amazing interconnected story would he pair the fourth living creature, the eagle, with the pale green horseman of Revelation 6. And that pale green horseman brings death to the world by means of the beast of the earth, the United States of America, symbolized by the eagle. All of this is so perfectly symmetrical. It has to be true. And if this does not convince you, then there's no convincing you. Now we're going to show you the comparison between Rome and the United States. We saw how Revelation 17.8 describes the beast that was. Rome was the empire that ruled over God's first people, the Jewish people. Then Rome fell in 476 AD and is not. And now the empire of the United States will be the, and yet is, when it rules over God's second people, Christians. These two empires are connected in so many ways. Now, both the government structures of Rome and the United States were structured as republics. They both had a Senate and assemblies of people to enact laws. We talked about how both their symbols were the eagle, which is a key symbolic animal. It's the fourth living creature in its reign over God's people. And when both of the countries had problems, they were both having severe internal divisions within them before the republics fell. We'll bring in the statue from Daniel 2 with just the last two kingdoms that we've said are Rome and the United States. And if you look at the elements to these kingdoms, they are represented by the common element of iron. If you check your history books, the end of the Iron Age in Europe coincided with the fall of the Roman Republic around 1st century BC. Then we talked about how the military industrial complex was the warning from Eisenhower that preceded the assassination of Kennedy and led to the Iron Triangle. This Iron Triangle is a three-legged, mutually beneficial influencing between Congress, the bureaucracy, and the special interest groups that receive contracts to make it a beast. There is also no coincidence that the beginning of the military industrial complex and the Iron Triangle coincided with the beginning of the Ten Horns, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Like I said, the beast needed to be a beast again. So even the iron in the statue of Daniel provides a parallel between the two empires as both republics fall. We'll keep going. When Rome was taken over by its first emperor, it had 50 legions of army units. And when the United States gets taken over by its emperor, It'll be taken over with 50 states. These parallels are foolproof. We also talked about the fall of the Roman Empire as a process that led to an emperor taking control. We are presently seeing the fall of the Republic in the United States. The only thing to wait for in this parallel is for the Empire of the United States to be taken over by who we know as the Antichrist. 
We know from history that the Empire of Rome had control over the first witness of God, the Jewish people, where the Empire oppressed Jews and killed Jesus, which eventually led to the Jewish temple being destroyed. And if you know your Revelation, specifically chapters 11 and 13, those chapters detail how the Antichrist will have power over the second witness of God, Christians, where he oppresses and kills Christians, which leads to the spiritual temple of God to be destroyed, built by the Holy Spirit, the body of Christ that unites all Christians. Every single thing here is a match parallel between the two empires, Rome and the United States, the beast that was and is not and yet is. By the way, if you're wondering where the rapture comes in, in the next month or two, we will do a video explaining exactly when the rapture takes place. It'll be clear by the connections in the Bible itself. Then let's get rid of all of this so we can bring in the patterns of 50 in the Bible. Last slide, we talked about how Rome had those 50 legions before an emperor came into power. And then obviously the USA will have 50 states before the Antichrist takes power. We went through the other examples in the Bible. Starting with the Tower of Babel, there were 70 total names listed in the Table of Nations. And after analyzing the names, there were 20 names written in plural form denoting peoples. And groups of peoples came after Babel was broken up by God. That means in the Table of Nations, there were 50 of those names that were in Babel before the breakup of the city. Then we brought up the two rebellious sons of David who tried to take over his kingdom. In the second book of Samuel, Absalom ran with 50 men as he tried to take control over the kingdom. And also in the first book of Kings, Adonijah ran with 50 men before him when he tried to take control of the kingdom. Then we showed in the second book of Samuel how King David bought the threshing floor, which becomes the place for the temple of God that his son builds for 50 shekels. We also talked about the story of Elijah and how he called for fire and destroyed two sets of 50 men in the second book of Kings. You can see how God has woven the number 50 into these stories, but we're not done yet. The biggest one is still to come. In Revelation, the great city of Babylon is said to be symbolized by the city of Sodom. So we went to the story of Sodom in Genesis with Abraham. Before God rained down brimstone on the city, Abraham intercedes with God for the righteous people still left in the city. Abraham starts at 50 and negotiates God down to 10. If God finds 10 righteous people, he won't destroy the city. And obviously, there weren't 10 righteous people because God does destroy the city of Sodom. But the countdown is from 50 down to 10. Do you think it's a coincidence that the USA has 50 states and the story of the first beast is triggered by the 10 horns, which are the 10 presidents we mentioned previously? The number 50 and its countdown to 10. But that's Satan's countdown to his first beast. That isn't the parallel to Abraham and Sodom by God. In the story of the two witnesses and their resurrection in chapter 11, when the second witness comes back to life and the rapture occurs, a tenth of the city of Babylon is destroyed. And since the United States is the first beast of Revelation, then it will be a countdown of 50 states down to a tenth of the city being destroyed, just like the countdown before Sodom. Not everyone believes in these number patterns or even numerology. But these numerical patterns are not happenstance. God plants these into the stories to let you connect the dots and know what's going to happen in the future. Then let's clear everything for the last connections. And these are the United States as the first beast in real life. We told you that since the United States is the first beast, it's most likely that the Antichrist, the second beast, will be a future president. And this is hiding in plain sight. The presidential limo that carries the president around is called the beast. We talked about Daniel chapter 3. That chapter was about forced worship of the statue which represented Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. We analyzed the dimensions of the statue to reveal they are at a 10 to 1 ratio. We then showed you that the Washington Monument is also at a 10 to 1 ratio and went the distance in converting the monument to inches and yielding nothing but sixes. Every way you look at this, the truth points in one direction. And finally, God is so symmetrical in his storytelling. The first rebellious kingdom, 
detailed by the story of the Tower of Babel, where before being broken up by God, everyone had the same language. Then after God stops the city from being built, scatters all the people, creating multiple peoples, nations, and languages. And only in this amazing story would the last rebellious kingdom, the USA, which is known as the Great Melting Pot, where peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues come to live. Man, oh man, this stuff connects every which way, only because it is the truth. The United States is the first beast of revelation. If you've made it this far, you deserve some kind of a medal. I know this has been a really long video, maybe even overkill with all the information that was connected, but I think this first beast will be a critical concept to get people looking in the right direction. The great delusion that Paul talked about will have people confused, and Satan will play on that to deceive many and point to someone else, much like Satan deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden. There's going to be one last prophet sent by God, but Satan also knows this, and that's why the Antichrist in Revelation is called a false prophet. This will be that great delusion. Many will not know who is who. I'm here to help you look in the right direction. And don't blindly follow me either. Test what I'm saying and see if it connects to the Bible. And examine those parallels. I hope I've been able to explain how everything connects perfectly. The United States will be the first beast of Revelation. If I've convinced you, please share this video as much as you can. We need to warn people what to look for. This is coming in our lifetime, sometime soon. May God bless you all.